every Sunday we have what we call the effing meeting. And it's, it's the F's stand for food, finance, fun, and family. My YouTube channel has grown despite my best efforts to not have it. <laughs> despite. <laughs> Never heard that one before. How I got to 6 million downloads is as boring a, uh, an unsexy a story as people want. I just kept doing it. 20 to 25% of the working pop, the population are night owls. They identify as night owls and COVID helped night owls in a lot of ways because they were able to actually work according to their natural rhythms. Kind of like what you were alluding to, there's a lot of shame in being a night owl. Taylor Swift's tour has just destroyed records, right? Is Taylor a night owl, Mike? Mm -hmm. Think about it. Musicians, comedians, when are they perform when are they doing their job? At, at night. night. Even the most powerful person on the planet is a night owl. And this is when Barack Obama was president. Welcome back to Inside the Creator Studio, an origin story podcast about the world's best video content creators. My name is Katie. And my name is Mo. On today's episode, we have Mike Vardy, who's the founder and chief writer at Productivityist, where he helps people stop doing productive and start being productive. More about what that means later. He also hosts a podcast called A Productive Conversation, and we're going to talk to him about night owl productivity why he pivoted from a short-form solo podcast to a long-form interview podcast, and how he grew it to over 6 million downloads. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to multiple platforms at the same time and record remote podcasts in studio quality. It's built for creators to make your life way easier. It's what we use to record this podcast. Mike Vardy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mo and Katie. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. We're going to start off with some rapid fire questions. Try sure. to keep these to like three sentences or less. What is your setup for this call? Tell us about your computer, camera, mic, and light. Mac Studio, um, the uh, baseline model. I've got a, so that's my computer. I've got an A10 Mini Pro that's connected to a Panasonic, Lum Panasonic Lumix G85. That's right in front of me here. Uh, I have an Elgato key light up there and then like just an Amazon like cheapo light on the side to kind of give me some side light. Um, don't have any backlight on right now, but I think because the depth of field is not too bad, it's okay. But I do have um, this nice little uh, moon behind me uh, to kind of give a bit of, of ambiance. And I have a Rodecaster Pro that I'm using, which is connected to this uh, fine Rode pod mic. That is, oh, in my headphones, I'm wearing the M-E-E -E clear um, over the ear earbuds. So you can't see that I'm actually wearing them and they're wired connected to the Rodecaster Pro. Yeah, I didn't even see you were wearing them. I'm yeah. like, what headphones? Yeah, they, there they are. <gasps> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> so wow. Very really professional. Yeah, so it, when, when COVID hit, you know, and I, I don't just do, you know, obviously podcasting and writing and all that stuff, but I do uh, talks as well as seminars. It's nice to be able to say to people like, Oh, do you have all the setup? I'm like, yes, of course I do. Like I have all the bells and whistles for audio. And then when I do presentations, because the A10 mini allows me to hook up my iPad pro or my iPhone or even a secondary camera, which I don't have hooked up right now, I'm able to do like these fades and stuff. And it kind of blew people away because they were just so used to being on like a, just a, a video platform that they didn't know a lot about, right? Like I know you could do a lot of stuff within software such as StreamYard and, and things like that. But most people were just getting on their platform and going. And I'm like, no, let yeah. me let, you know, the A10 mini allows me to fade in and do picture in picture and all that stuff. So it's having that video switcher was kind of nice, especially it's overkill right now for everything. <laughs> like for what I'm doing now, it's a bit of overkill, but uh, it's nice to be able to scale if I need to into those kind of uh, to where I can use these devices to their utmost. But yeah, and, and my monitor is just like an LG monitor, so it doesn't have like a webcam on it. So I figure why have a webcam when I've got this A10 Mini, I can just use my uh, G85, which has served me pretty darn well. Awesome. What was the last meal you ate today? 
I'm drinking it right now. Coffee. Um, I don't <laughs> eat early in the morning. I'm a night owl. So my first meal will typically be probably just just either around lunchtime, like 11, between 11 and 12, I'll eat and I'll have a Nutribullet shake. That'll be my first meal of the day. But right now it's just coffee and, and I've got some water over here. Uh, nowadays, typically, when do you wake up and when do you go to bed? <laughs> so I wake up typically at 8 a.m. Uh, yeah, between 7.30 and 8 a.m. And I go to bed at around 1. Um, I will take a nap midday. So before my kid, my young, my son gets home from school at 3, I'll probably take a nap either be just before he gets home or just after he gets home, depending. Uh, and that's shifted over the years, too, because now that he's a teenager, he doesn't care if I'm <laughs> willing to hang out with him when I get home so I can take it at three. But I used to take it around two 30. So that way it would act as like kind of a shift of the day from being work mode to father mode. Ah, uh, okay. And how long is the nap? Do you set an alarm? No, I have what, um, Austin Kleon talked about this and he's not the only one others have it, it's called a caffeine nap. So what I'll do is I'll drink a cup of coffee, um, at about two, or so. And then by the time that's done, I'll close my eyes, uh, probably about 215, 220. And then it'll be typically about a like a single 30, like a 30 minute nap. Like I won't go through a full sleep cycle um, because the caffeine then kicks in about 20 to 25 minutes after you've finished. And so it wakes you up naturally. So, uh, but I do have a, uh, an app called power nap that I have in my, uh, on my phone that I keep in my pocket that I also time it that way, just in case. What's your morning ritual. If you have one, uh, I get up, I throw, uh, I, we have a rain shower, so I dunk my head under cold water. So that way it wakes me up because as a night owl, I suck at mornings. I come downstairs, I start making my coffee in one form or another, either pour over or AeroPress or whatever. And then I come into my study here and I start to do low energy tasks. I might read a little bit to start off. Um, I have done morning pages before, but not right now. And then once I'm done that, um, I know what my daily theme is. And then I just get started with the day. What hobbies have you spent the most time on this year? Time or money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm getting into fountain pens a lot more oh. this year. So, uh, so I've been spending time learning about that as well as purchasing fountain pens, both from, you know, Amazon, but also local stores and even AliExpress because you can get decent ones there. Um, watches. I'm getting into watches more. I'm wearing a, I'm just wearing a, a Timex field watch right now, like an expedition, but I'm starting to geek out about watches and learning more about that. I'd say those are the two hobbies that I've probably spent the most time and slash money on in the past <laughs> year. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. We're done with the rapid fire questions. Now, Let's immediately dispel the idea ju that just because you create content about productivity that you're never unproductive. So <laughs> can you talk about some unproductive days you've had recently or some tasks or projects that you've been procrastinating on for months? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do they say? We teach what we need to learn the most, right? Um, so there's a couple. Uh, one is the, the um, I've got a book proposal that I've been working on for – my next book, the book that I'm that's coming out in January, is in phases of editing and stuff. So that one I haven't been procrastinating on as much. But the the uh, proposal has taken me time to do more than I would like because I don't like writing book proposals. So that's probably the reason why. Well, it's definitely the reason why. Um, so that would be a task, like a project that I've been procrastinating on. It's been kind of niggling on me as well. Um, really putting together YouTube strategy has been another one. You know, even getting into using StreamYard, which when we met Mo at, at Podcast Movement, <laughs> I haven't do dove into that too much either. So I'd say like getting into something new, which is weird because typically I get caught in the middle where I will start to procrastinate. But for this one, I think I'm almost procrastinating because it's a rabbit hole I could go down. So there's two forms there. One is like kind of in in the weeds and the other is, oh, I can see the weeds and I don't want to go anywhere near them. Um, an unproductive day as of late that I can remember, and I'll give you two examples really quickly. One is um, a friend of mine passed away not too long ago, like a little, actually a week today of this recording. Wow. And it was, we knew it was coming. In fact, we knew the exact day it was coming because that, you know, he was at a point where, you know, organs were failing and all that stuff. So I didn't think 
I mean, we were friends and we had hung out off and on over the past few years and he was in his seventies. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, he hadn't lived a good long life, but it, that Friday, even though I wasn't seeing him and all that stuff, having that in my head was an, made it an unproductive day. Now we all, de- those days happen, right? Like that's a day that's completely out of my, I mean, that's where I had to be human. Right. And I think that's part of it. Like just to be, allow yourself to have that is fine. Um, and it's necessary because it's what makes us human. Now, another unproductive day would be, um, let's say the, uh, of gosh, it was about three weeks ago. Um, my wife and son were both home and it was a work day for me. And I remember that I spent a lot of time doing stuff that was for them, but it was, you know, it didn't need to be done at that time. So I was doing, which is weird because you could say that's busy work. I'm like, yeah, but if it's family and personal stuff, it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like you're contributing. But when I wrote my journal entry at the end of the day, I recognized. And then when I planned the next week, I saw, oh, geez, there was a lot of stuff that I should have done on that day in particular, as well as what I did on that day that totally flew in the face of what the daily theme was and what I should be focusing on. And that, and you know, I course corrected. So I just had to spread what I was going to do on those days over a couple of subsequent days. But yeah, that would be it. So two examples. One is I was obviously avoiding probably the book proposal, (laughs) but I was avoiding some stuff to do the stuff for my family, kind of like productivity in disguise for lack of a better term. And then the other was just, it was just something that happened in life that was, we, we will come across and that one I was okay with. And so the journaling helps because I can recognize when something is completely, you know, under my command and then another where it's like, okay, I'm going to give myself some slack. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, why did you get obsessed, for lack of a better word, with productivity? I think what happened was I was trying to create this balance of getting all of the stuff done that I wanted to in my life back when I was working at Costco and trying mm. to meet someone to be with and move up in the chain at Costco. But I was still pretty new to Victoria where I live now. So when I when I really started to lean into productivity practices was when I was the food court and service deli manager at Costco. So I was, uh, those are two, while they seem like they're similar businesses, they're fundamentally different in that one is very responsive or reactive, the food court, for example. I mean, you're not going to cook 500 hot dogs and then just wait for people to come up and order them. You have to kind of order them on demand or you're going to have really crappy hot dogs. <laughs> Whereas, and you're front facing with the members, the customers, right? Whereas the service deli, you're behind glass. <laughs> like you're, you're making stuff. There was, I mean, you have to make 500 chicken pot pies because if you don't, then the next time you make a batch of those, you may be trying to fill the coffins, which is what they call them, the coffin coolers. Uh, again, so there are two fundamentally different areas. And I'm, and there was a lot of, um, it wasn't tasks that were so much a problem. It was going from one that is very responsive and, and customer service oriented to one that's more merchandise oriented. So I realized that between those two things, plus I want to meet somebody, plus I'm still getting acclimatized to this new city. I'm like, I need something to kind of help me. Um, And so I started to look at like Covey's stuff. And even Tony Robbins had this program called The Time of Your Life. And as a night owl, um, you can, I remember distinctly watching like one of Tony Robbins's infomercials that used to be on like late night TV back when the infomercials were on TV. And that's, I think, was the like, oh, I should pick. Well, this will help me have a more fulfilling and, and, and you know, I'll be able to do all the things. So I'll pick up a program. And I did, but I picked up the, I think I picked up his personal power program or Get the Edge. That's what it was. And then I picked up his Time of Your Life as a supplemental program. And I actually bought that off eBay because I couldn't find it on his site. So I bought it like for a fraction of the cost. It's amazing what self-help programs will go for on the secondary market. Uh, you could save a ton of money because most people are just like, ah, I didn't, didn't work for me. So sorry. Yeah, They just give up, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what started it. And then, you know, I started to put things in place, like using different colorings. And because I worked in two different departments, like theming, like this is how I'm going to be on this day. And, and so it's really the Genesis started then. 
And then as I made my way out of Costco, working my way, like I, I actually demoted myself from manager to part-time employee so I could start to do more of the things I really wanted to do. And no one did that. No one went from like making like good money as a manager to going, yeah, you know what? I want to be part-time. Um, I had a bit of leverage because I'd been there a long time. So I was going to get paid at the top rate and all that stuff. But really I wanted my time back. I wanted, I wanted them to have to say to me, and I'll preface this by saying Costco is a fantastic place to work, but I think every place can have its shelf life. And uh, I remember them saying, well, why wouldn't you want to be full-time? I'm like, because then I have to ask to go home to work on the thing I'm building on the side. In this case, you have to ask me to stay later. So you have to schedule me for at least 25 hours. But if you want me to stay longer, the ball's in my court as opposed to the opposite. So I wanted that agency, right? So to me, um, that was a that was the beginning of it all. And then it just kind of snowballed from I took those lessons I learned from there and it kind of snowballed from there. Nice. I love that. Yeah. I love that you you were th- very conscious about what the default relationship was like in terms of how much of your time they owned. And I also like that when you got into productivity, it wasn't just because of work or like trying to make more money, you were also thinking about relationships and like you were trying to meet someone. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's funny. I was asked the other day, like, why do you do what you do? Do you run your own business? Do you try to help people because you want them to be more productive because they'll make more money or because they'll be healthier or they'll be happier. And I think when, when I've chatted with people, the message again and again is happier. Like, you know, we don't, we, you know, we're making our way through time, Right. And there's this great movie called About Time, which I love and I watch every year. And it is, I watch it every year on August 31st. And it's like this reminder that, you know, we are all traveling through time regardless. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, money comes and goes. You know, health is important, obviously. But I think that that happiness is the, and having a good relationship with time, fostering a good relationship with time can lead to those other things. But you can't do that if you're coming out of at it from a place of negativity or hurry or or worry, right? So to me, yeah, that's I didn't really think about that too much in terms of why I was doing what I was doing until someone like really said, "It sounds like what you just said, Mo." The idea of you know it's about relationships and stuff like that because that's the thing. I think the most important relationship that you can work on isn't the one with yourself is fine, but it's the one with time because. Time, I mean, you, that's the relationship you're in from day one until day done, right? So to me, if you improve your relationship with time, then that will help you improve your relationships with other people, other situations. I think that's, that's why I don't, it, yeah, sure. I say I'm a productivity strategist and a time management strategist, but the first thing I'll say with people when I'm working with them is I don't like the term productivity. I think it's broken. I'd rather use the term that came before it productiveness, right? I don't believe in the term time management. Time cannot be managed. You can't manage something that moves on whether you want it to or not, but managing your relationship with time, you can do that. So that's, that's kind of where I focus my energy and my, my, um, my, my ability to help people and have an impact is in, in those areas. And yeah, it's, it's, it's harder to, let's say, sell that because it's not quantifiable, but I think it's, uh, it's incredibly important because it will lead to things that are. I might be reading too much into this, like an English lit major or something, but like, I wonder if that's one of the reasons you've been um, spending a lot of time and money buying watches and thinking about watches. Is is that because of time? Is there some symbolism there? there? So I never used to wear a watch and I'm still really good at telling quote telling. I don't like tell time either, but that's a whole semantics philosophical (laughs) argument. Um, I was really good at knowing what time it was based on the cadence of the day. Because again, like if you spend a lot of time studying something, you, you kind of are immersed in it and you get a real simpatico relationship with it. But uh, the reason that I wanted it is the reason that my fascination with watches has kind of come on board is first off, um, there is a personalized aspect to watches. So everyone like, you know, there's, high quality watches that are worth a lot of money that people will put on their wrists. And I'll be the first one to say, okay, well, why did you spend your money on that? Like, what's the point? Like some, and a lot of people, there's a story behind it. Like why'd they get the Rolex? Why'd they get the Omega, whatever. Right. But for me, it was more about the, there was that aspect, the, the, the nuanced personalized aspect of each and every time piece. But for me, 
I wanted to be able to know what time it was without having all of the other stuff around it that you get with smart watches. I didn't want the Apple watch because I don't need, I mean, yes, activity is nice, but if I get out and go for a walk every single day and work out regularly, I'll be fine. Right. Like, you know, I don't need to know what my heart rate is. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's just for me. Um, and the other thing is I, but the biggest thing is I didn't want the notifications. I didn't want all that. I, and frankly, all of my watches are analog because I have terrible vision when I'm not wearing my glasses. So I needed to be able to look at a watch and go, Oh, I can tell by the long hand and the shorthand what time it is. But that it, the, there's a craftsmanship to watches, watchmaking too. Like horology, there's a lot that goes into it. Mechanical watches, automatic watches, quartz. Like you can go really deep in the route, ra- just like pens. Fountain pens, I think is the same. There's a craft to them, right? Like different nib sizes. I'm also a left-handed person. So most people are like, well, don't you have smears and all that stuff? I'm like, yeah. So I had to learn what I needed to make sure that didn't happen. I had to buy inks that, you know, dried faster. I'm better with, you know, extra fine and fine nibs and stuff like that. And those things, frankly, take time to not only understand, but also to um, recognize and go, okay, well, this is what, this is the best type of fountain pen for me. This is the best type of watch for me. But to recognize that there's still a ton of choices around those. I think that's the other thing, too, is that, that with time and, and uh, you know, as, we're, as I'm thinking about this, uh, you know, we f- we have a limited amount of it. But uh, there is so much that live within that limits, right? Like there's only so many fountain pens that will work well with a left handed person and so, so on and so forth. But there's still a lot to choose from. Same thing with watches. I want the watch to be like this and this and this. OK, great. Here's 43 options for you in that price range. Whereas, and so with time, it's like, well, I'm, you know, I only have so many years in my life. There's only so many hours in the day. Okay. So how are you going to use them? Everyone's going to use them differently. So, you know, craft your time the way that you need and want it to be crafted so that you can do the things you need to do and be the person you want to be and have, you know, the life that you want to have. And so I think that there is a relationship for sure between all of those things. Okay. And you described your mission as helping people stop doing productive and start being productive. Can you unpack that? What does that mean? So doing productive means just checking off boxes for the sake of checking off boxes. So we confuse activity with progress. We, we confuse doing things that will get us to, um, if we do enough things, we'll get to where we want to go. But the problem is we end up doing things that we don't need to be doing, or, or, or we do things we don't want to do just so that we can, um, you know, say that we've been productive, right? Like, so let's use an example of inbox zero hate the term, not because of what it meant, but because of what it's become. Because when Merlin Mann coined the phrase, it was all about like getting out of your email with nothing kind of weighing you down. You knew what was waiting for you back there. Like you didn't have to have your email count at zero. You just needed to know that when you went back into your inbox, what was waiting for you. That was the idea. Um, now it's, you know, being used as a measuring stick for how productive you are. Oh, I got my email down. I had 433 emails and I'm down to inbox zero. Great. But what's your job? Well, I'm the CEO of the company. Okay, great. But so then was that the mission, right? You know, if you're customer service, I might applaud you for that, right? So to me, the doing productive, it's it's quantitatively measuring productivity without taking into account the qualitative aspect. Being productive is a combination of both. I don't believe productivity is about efficiency and effectiveness first and foremost. Those are byproducts of being productive because you're going to suck when you start doing something. So are you going to be productive at it? No. But the more you have that intention of getting better at it, writing, you know, get, you know, working on a doing video, live streaming, et cetera, podcasting, the more a- attention you give to that intention, the better you'll get at it, which means the more productive you'll be. So productivity is about the active linking of intention, what you need and or want to do, and your attention, which you have command over both of those things. What you don't have command over is time. What you don't have command over is, or control over rather, is time. You don't have control over that. But what you do is you look at your task list and you say, okay, well, do I need to do all these things? If you if you do, then that's a, that's a conversation that we go a little bit deeper on. But doing productive is just, you know, again, checking off as many boxes as you can just to say, okay, look, look, look what I did. Look, look how productive I've been, but to what end, right? Whereas being productive is like, you know, you can chalk up at the end of the day that even if you only did six things, they were the six things that absolutely needed to be done and that you wanted to do. And you did them not only in the right way, but at the, in the way that works best for you, 
without forsaking what others need as well. So it's, it's, it's a responsive way to work as opposed to a reactive way to work. Yeah. I love that. I think <laughs> the inbox zero example is a great example, especially with the CEO. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I feel like the fascination with productivity, I guess, in this day and age sort of started with social media because people felt like they were losing time, sort of getting wrapped up in scrolling um, and checking for notifications. You've been in this space for longer than that. So when do you think the actual sort of obsession with it, I would say, because I think there's so many YouTube videos on it, so many people are trying to crack that and get into the space. Um, when do you think that started and how has it changed or evolved in the time that you've been involved in it? So I would say that it started well before any of this technology showed up. It's just been more heightened and our awareness around it is heightened because of the way that the internet is just, you know, basically commanded our attention in a lot of ways to issues that are e either really important or trivial. Like it, it, I yeah. don't think there's, I think the one thing about the internet, which is hilarious, like anything else, really, this is just typical human behavior. And again, I'm not a behavioral scientist or anything like that, but you know, the things that stand out are the things that that yell and scream, right? Like the things that are quiet don't really get the attention that they maybe warrant on the internet. It's it's usually things that are allowed, right? And productivity, unfortunately, uh, I think the shift started back in the Industrial Revolution where people were like, we can make things, but now we can make them faster. So mm -hmm. let's just make them faster and not worry about making them better or even even maintaining the quality of them. So we just need to make more. And that was just, I mean, the technology allowed for it. So there was, they, they tested that. And then we're, we, you go back to things like motion theory and uh, you know, with um, gosh, Frederick Taylor and, and, and the people that were involved back in that those days, because productivity measurements have been around for a long, long time before David Allen and the getting things done stuff. I mean, there's a book called how to live on 24 hours a day that was written by Arnold Bennett, who, you know, he was typically, he was generally a novelist and just like Stephen Pressfield, Stephen Pressfield was a novelist and then wrote like, you know, the war of art. And that's the book that a lot of people talk about when they talk about Stephen Pressfield, which is like how to beat the resistance and how to, those things have been around forever. And, and, you know, the, the, the book, how to live on 24 hours a day written by Arnold Bennett talks about people sitting, like looking at their day and viewing it as not 24 hours, but the work day. Like they'd get and getting on the train and instead of scrolling through Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, depending on your age range, <laughs> depending on your demo, they were reading the newspaper and gossiping and things like that. So human behavior, like those things still existed. It's just different platforms yeah. uh, and the speed. So it's the speed and the, the onslaught, the, the consistency that, that, kind of pulls us away from the things that we really should be a caring about or be carrying on with. Right. So I think that what social media has done is number one, um, it, it creates this, this ability for us to be with people either that we agree with or don't agree with, you know, or to be in a community like the fountain pen groups that are on Facebook or the watch groups or on social. I mean, they're, they're, you know, on Twitter, they're starting to have circles and things like that. Or TikTok, you watch enough things on TikTok that are related to one thing. All of a sudden you're getting served all the things on TikTok that you were paying attention to for just a brief period of time. You're like, wait, now I'm getting all the, like, I can tell you, I was trying to build like um, templates. It was one of the things that was talked about podcast movement. Like, oh, I got to get better at TikTok. I'm going to look at, oh, here's a template. Oh, let me watch this video for the full length. Oh, let's watch another one full length. All of a sudden, now all my TikTok stream is all these templates for CapCut. I'm like, okay, I want to see other stuff, right? So I, I think social media, all, what it's done is is kind of, it's, you know, the echo chamber, right? You and I see lots of stuff about productivity. I probably see more than you do. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that are sitting there going, I don't hear about it. Like if I was to say to somebody, oh man, you should check out GTD. They're going to go, what's GTD or who's Covey or what's the, what's the Eisenhower matrix? Oh, you mean the Covey matrix? Oh, you mean the decision tree? Hey, the tickler file David Allen talks about in getting things done has existed since like, I think the late 1800s. So there's nothing really new. It's just like the day planner hasn't changed. Like there's a lot of things. It's just the pace the cadence, our ability to reclaim our attention has been, you know, fractured and, you know, some could say even corrupted. 
but we still have control over, like we still do, you yeah. can, you know, but nothing is geared towards that. So I think that, you know, productivity is going to be a hot button point for a lot of people regard, like, you know, depending on what they're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, the biggest solution I can have for anybody who's like, you know, obsessed with it or are me- trying to measure it in a way that isn't sustainable, you know, or it may be consistent, but certainly not sustainable. Take a breath, take a beat. You have, I mean, 30 seconds may feel like forever when you're not doing anything, but you can make better decisions around your, the things you need and want to do in that 30 seconds than you can by constantly playing whack-a-mole with the things that are coming at you, because that's certainly not productive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the tools have changed too. I mean, with Notion and Evernote and things out there, but I always think it's really funny that, um, I don't know, there's apps for ADHD or there's, there's apps that are geared towards productivity when a lot of times, at least for me, I feel like technology is the thing that prevents me from being productive in a lot of ways. So it's counterintuitive to be like, oh yeah, maybe I'll get an app. Maybe that's the solution. And a lot of times it's like, no, this is just making it worse. (laughs) Well, and the thing is, is that I think that there is, again, there's a, I'm a hybrid solution when it comes to productivity. I literally just bought, actually, I haven't, (laughs) I haven't opened it yet because my people want me to make a video about it. I just picked up a traveler's notebook from Midori. I picked up some inserts um, I love using paper. I mean, yeah. otherwise, why would I be buying fountain pens? That would be an incredible waste of of resources. <laughs> um, Just a doodle. Well, yeah, fair. But I mean, look at the bullet journal. Look at what Ryder's done with and his his team have done with the bullet journal. Ryder mm-hmm. Carroll and the bullet journal method has gotten. I mean, you go to YouTube, you type in bullet journal, you're going to see not just like the straight and narrow method that he brought, but he's even said like he made that for him. And then others have kind of taken it to their own, not the next level, but the next level that they need, right? So to your point, Mm -hmm. like people do that with apps as well. The hard part about the apps is that they are connected to others in a lot of cases. So you're getting external stuff, not just internal. So I'm a person that will look at my ClickUp. I use ClickUp. Mm -hmm. So I'll look at ClickUp for my work tasks. And then what I'll do is I'll pull them onto paper. So that way mm-hmm. I can get out of ClickUp for a while and just focus on the things that are on paper. And I have tools that help with it. the reason I picked up the Traveler's Notebook is I want to kind of see what I can put in there and experiment a bit. But yeah, I think that we're seeing more people go back to the digital space is where ev- is everything incubates, right? It's where and where interactions happen, um, not just with the, the the projects and tasks that we're working on when we're finally ready to get them out there, but also with the others that we're in collaborating with, let's say. But if you want to get focused, take even grab a sticky note or an index card and go, all right, these are the five things I want to work on. Let's get away from this task app or whatever we're using and dive into it. So I think that, and I mean, Evernote and Notion, I mean, look what happened. To Evernote's changed. People who get involved with an app, this is tricky because- Apps are, there's way more people developing and in the development area of apps than there are the the users that are using them. So for example, if I'm sitting here using ClickUp and I've gotten used to it, I'll give you an even better example. This has nothing to do with productivity. My wife and I just got an email from You Need a Budget, you know, the program You Need a Budget, and they just changed their user interface. I proactively emailed my wife the notification about it changing going, just so you know, dot, dot, dot because she hates it when an app changes for no reason. She's like, I don't understand. I don't understand. I'm like, it's number one. Sometimes it does make it better. Number two, there can be some in, in, you know, and I, I used to work for cults of Mac and the next one. There sometimes is a change for changes sake that needs to happen in the startup world to show that progress is being made, even though mm-hmm. it's not necessarily progress. Mm-hmm. Sorry to burst people's bubble. <laughs> watching this and going, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, you have to show that something's going on, which by the way, not a new thing. Government does this. Corporations do this for the, like, it's not a new thing. It's just being transferred to a, an industry that you may not be familiar with or that is new. And so, um, you know, if you're using paper, number one, doesn't ping. Number two, you get to decide how you want to. I mean, there are planners out there that like the full focus planner by Michael Hyatt, great planner, but there's a lot of people that will pick up that planner every 90 days and they'll use it to its fullest. And then there's others that will pick it up and only use the daily. And then they'll have that question. Was it worth it? 
I'm not mm-hmm. using all of it. And then they don't do it anymore. They're like, they, they, they throw the, the baby out with the bath water, so to speak. It'd be the equivalent of going, you know, well, I've got this app that I'm using for productivity, like Evernote or Notion or whatever, but I'm not really using it to its fullest. So should I just abandon the app altogether? Um, in some cases, yes, but the, there's that cost of, you know, there's obviously the sunk fallacy, but there's also the learning curve stuff. So yeah, I think that that like Evernote's experiencing a real interesting uh, period of their their journey right now as an app. Notion certainly has. I would argue that Notion is the new Evernote in a lot of ways. I mean, if you go back yeah, to what Evernote was doing, Notion's like that now. And I use Notion a little bit, not as my primary, but I'm using it in a couple of groups I'm with. I think it's fantastic for as long as you go in with a framework that you can carry from Notion to click up to the bullet journal to the, you know, my time crafting method, if that's what you want to use a framework. The, the thing is, is that you should never, if the tool goes away or changes, you should not be panicking based on the way that you do things because the app was what carried you through. You know, there's that phrase, men have become the tools of their tools. I think it was Walden that said that, mm. um, you know, or sorry, Thoreau that said that Walden, is, <laughs> Walden's where he used to live. But the point is, yeah. <laughs> the point is, is that you better have a frame. I, I think you have to have an approach down before you go into the application. So focus on the app within first and then, you know, take it to where, whether it's paper, uh, digital or both. I think that, that you really, everyone's solution is different. So when someone says to me, well, what app should I use? I'm like, I don't know. And they're yeah. like, but you, what, you're the expert. I'm like, yeah, but I need to know so much more about you before I can even give you a recommendation. So, yeah, it, it's – and and I don't blame people for being overwhelmed because there's a lot to choose from. And then you've got your work one. You've got So if you have a, a way you can operate at work and operate at home that's congruent, then the apps are just – you know, they're, they're the things that allow you to facilitate it. But, you know, if an app – like I said, I've had so many people that have – bought into an app and then all of a sudden they're like, now what do I do? I'm like, well, what's your system? Well, I, you know, I don't have one. That's the problem because you could have the best app in the world, but garbage in garbage out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And something like notion that's really customizable. I sort of went down that rabbit hole where I was trying to customize it for myself and you watch a video and you start, I don't know, using one of their, um, Templates. Templates. Yeah. I was like, why can't I think of the word? Um, and because there's, there's, there's thousands of them. Out there. There's thousands of them. Also, yeah. it's Friday, but <laughs> I'm, it. I'm trying to use this person's template and it looks great in theory. And then I'm like, okay, I never want to touch this again because my brain is not working this way. And it's different for everybody. I know someone who uses Outlook and they're like, they have some sort of like Outlook task and it's just like crazy. And she's like, yeah, I need to change this at some point, but then I have to shift everything over and that's going to take forever. But like yep. a system is a system. And if the system works, then why break it? You know, unless you have to with, with the tool can, going away. But you can scale it, right? Like, so the system, you should be able to take the system. If a system that you have will not work on paper, then you need to work on the system. Mm, that's good advice. You should be able to use it. I mean, obviously, there's things like collaborating that you can't do across the miles. But how do we used to pass tasks on to people? There was an envelope that would go around the office that would have their name on it. They would open it up, or there'd be, or you would, you would give them a, you'd, you'd go to their desk and say, "Hey, can you work on this?" Or like that's just the typical way that you, and you would leave people to. Here's the thing: you would leave people to their own devices for both literally and figuratively, <laughs> and then they would get the work done. Now it's you know we are in this era of where you could literally follow everyone else. The CEO could follow everyone's tasks in ClickUp, in Notion, in wherever, is that the best use of their time? Probably not. And also they're going to use it different. Like that's the other thing is if you have an app, if you have, if you run a business and you are using an app, you should have some definitely like ground rules, like a baseline guidelines for lack of a better term for your team members. But every team member should be able to add their own little nuance to it because everyone works subjectively towards the objective that they're trying to achieve. So if you're in a company, there's what 40 people, let's say in one company that's trying to all work towards the same objective. They're all going to work subjectively to get there. If you're a night owl, you're going to tackle those higher, higher energy things later in the day. If you're an early riser, you're going to do it earlier in the day, right? So you need to be able to like, I I'll tell people if they're using a tool like notion, for something and they're like, well, we use it for a tap. I'm like, do you have a field in there for energy? 
They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, have a field in there for energy levels. So that way people can like identify tasks that will take a lot or little energy. And your rule should be, if, it, if you can't decide if it's high or low energy, then don't give it an energy level. Like, because mm. then, then all of a sudden you're creating overwhelm within overwhelm. Right. Yeah. So I said, and the reason you do that is not only will they know that they can, ass- that some people work better knowing like, Hey, here's my energy and I'm going to tackle all these low energy things early or late and vice versa. I go, but, and this is where, it, you know, changing behavior can start. If you're the person watching them, you're the CEO and you really, now you'll get to know who your night owls are, who your early risers are. You'll know, you'll see patterns there. But if your patterns are like, are they getting it done or are they not getting it done? Those aren't giving you the answers that you want. There, there's too much story in there, right? So to me, um, yeah, it, it, it's really important that if you're running a business that you have what we call, I call it a team task management charter that says like, here are the ground rules. Here's the tags or labels that we use most commonly. We don't use, you know, notion for external. We use it for internal. So if it's internal communications, you keep it in a chat that's in notion related, like you can do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you want to be able to have Mo and Katie and Mike be able to add their own nuances to it so that they can open up notion. And unlike what you said, Katie, not go, well, not open in this again. I'm just going to, I'm yeah. just going to, I'm just going to use email as my task manager. Okay. That's, that's the equivalent of me being in the food court at what during lunch rush while I'm trying to also do some other stuff and having the f- floor, there's tons of people coming up asking for hot dogs while I'm also trying to do other things. You know, I'm now in this, I, I have to adjust my day because during lunch, there's no way I'm like, Hey everyone, I'm going to go be, be in the office working on, uh, you know, my, my figures, my, my budgetary numbers. My staff would look at me and go, are you like, if I did that, they go, are you nuts? It's lunch rush. What are you doing? Like, this is when we're right. Yeah, This is go time. Uh, right. Which is why I wouldn't be in the service deli during lunch rush. Right. But I would be in the service deli between, you know, eight and 10 AM to help them get ready because the store opened at 10 AM. Then at 10 AM, I would book my way back to the front because the, the store was now open or the warehouse was now open. So yeah, you have to be able to work subjectively. You have to give yourself. And if you're a leader, you have to give the ability for others to work subjectively towards their objectives and apps allow you to do that. As long as you don't just go, here's an app and leave people to their own to try to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I like what you said earlier about there's nothing new under the sun. Like some of these ideas have been around for, for centuries. And I guess there's like different ways of framing ideas because you've clearly had like your material has resonated with your audience. And I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the the big ideas that you've become known for? One you mentioned is the time crafting method. Let us mm-hmm. know what that is. But another one you mentioned uh, is like um, writing energy levels for each task. Could you bring up some, like, what are some of the other big ideas that you think creators would really benefit from? So time crafting is the framework. It used to be called the now year method back when I first started putting it together. It was a formula, then it was a method. And then I really realized that time crafting was a better framing device for it, better word. When I was taking my son to school one day and he was talking about Minecraft and he was saying like, Minecraft is, I'm like, explain to me how it works. Because when you're with your kids, you shouldn't be going, so tell me what you're doing at school. Because they're going to go, oh, nothing. Or how was school today? Oh, it's fine. Like, I want to engage in better conversation. And so he said, well, Dad, the way Minecraft works is you take raw materials, like, and he listed, like, four of them, and you make something out of them. So you have a desk, and then you you, you can craft different materials out of it. And I'm like, I started to think about it. I'm like, that's really what we do with time. We take different, you know, times of day, months, uh, tasks, the, the seasons that we're in and we basically craft a life with the time that we have. And so I really, once we, once I cracked that, then I started to dive, you know, kind of combining everything. So you mentioned Mo, the energy levels thing. One of the things I do when I work with people is time crafting is, is there's theming of your time. So time theming, which is themes, your days, your weeks, your months, whatever. But there's also what I call attention paths, which are, how are the, what are the paths for your attention? So there's like five categories of it that I teach and they all spell the word, they spell the word treat. So the acronym is treat. So time, so time needed. So, you know, these tasks will take me five minutes. Great. Categorize it with a five minutes. So if you have a meeting 30, like if you're going between podcast guests today, Katie, like you did, and you have 30 minutes, instead of going, what can I do in 30 minutes? 
I'll check email because I know I can do that and I don't have a lot of time to get into some deep work. It would be better for you to be able to look at your task list and go, oh, here are all my five minute tasks. Let's see mm-hmm. how many of these I can bang out. So you're not looking at the details of the task. It's I, I use it uh, the way I, I consider attention paths to work is um, the you walk into a shopping mall and you see the mall directory, right? And you know, like, oh, there's a Target here, and there's a, you know, there's a, there's a Cinnabon here, and there's all that. You know, generally, what each of those places will have, but you don't know how busy they are, where their stock is, what they have, pricing. That's when you go in the store. That's like the the equivalent of the to do list. So if the the mm-hmm. calendar kind of offers the directory of the days, hey, there's the Cinnabon, but and then the to do list is, oh, here's the menu, here's the pricing, here's how busy. So it's the details. You don't need to look at the details of the task initially based on the way the brain works. The brain doesn't go, uh, I'm hungry. Uh, let me get some food from where I am. It goes, I'm hungry. Where is the food? The food is in the kitchen. Great, I will go to the kitchen. What food do I have? Oh, I have all this food, right? Because you don't know. You may have an idea, but you don't definitely know. So, yeah. you know, the kitchen is the place that you go because you're not going to go, I'm hungry. And then you go to the bathroom like, where's the food? I don't understand, right? Oh, mm-hmm. wait, it's that movie where the guy keeps the stash in the toilet uh, lid or whatever. Uh, there was a movie where that happened. Can't remember a TV show. But anyways, the point is. Oh, my God. That, yeah, <laughs> the point is is that he had it in a, a waterproof bag, relaxed, it's all good, everybody. But anyway, the, point is, the point is, is that we we tend to look at the details of the task first and we get tripped up in that, right? So uh, so to me, that like with time crafting, there's again, like time. Resource is another one. Like, what do I need? The person, the place, or the thing? Hey, I need to talk about Mo, to Mo about these five different things. I know, instead of sending Mo five different emails, I'll batch it into one, or I'll assign it to the proper. So that way Mo's not getting five interruptions. He's getting one, mm-hmm. right? Or I'm, I'm now in the kitchen. What can I do while I'm in the kitchen? Right. Oh, I can clean it. I can make food. I can do whatever. Right. That's a resource. The kitchen is the resource. Uh, next is energy. So what energy level do you have? So the other thing I'm known for Mo, which is probably a good answer, is the night owl stuff. When people talk about a night owl being productive, most people go, you should talk to Mike because most people say that night owls can't be productive. They procrastinate. They're lazy. It's a, it's not true. Uh, not at all. Um, it's the, at least it's not a, true as a generalization. I'm sure there are lazy night owls out there, but the point is, is that as a night owl, I will tackle my low energy stuff earlier in the day because I'm not at my best. But then later in the day, like after 2 PM, you know, things start. So that's when I'll do my more creative work. The more, the more, you know, energy required, I'll do it later in the day. If you're an early riser, it's the opposite, right? You'll be like, Hey, I want to start my day, hit the ground running. So it'd be great to look at all your, to look at your list and go, here are all my high energy tasks Mm. and choose from those six, as opposed to the 323 that you have on your list that you're just working through sequentially, or you're just looking at inside of a project. Activity is the other. So that's the A activity is like the type of activity, writing, reading, studying, and writing could be different. There could be book writing. There could be blog writing. There could be course writing. There could be script writing. So that each of them have their own nuances to them. And then finally, theme, which, again, I alluded to off the top, the theme. So what theme does this fall under? So what happens is is time crafting allows people to kind of think instead of, what am I going to do today? It's like, okay, it's when today's Friday. Now, today's my cheat day. I don't have a theme for today. But when I wake up on most days of the week, I go, not – what am I going to do today? I'm like, what day is it? Oh, it's Thursday. Oh, Thursday's optimization day. What optimization tasks am I going to focus on? doesn't mean I only do them. It just gives me a starting point as opposed to what am I going to do today? Because my brain goes, if, if that's the question, then you're going to be like, well, there's lots to do. Oh, right. Great. As opposed to having a starting point, right? Now, the reason I saw Mo, your eyes went up when you're like, Friday is a cheat day. Yeah, because Friday, like Katie, you just mentioned, it's Friday. I'd rather be able to go by attention path and theme. Like, it's Friday. I'm tired. What are all my low energy tasks? I don't care what project they're related to. I don't care. I just want to see everything that's going to either take me five minutes or is low energy. And I can look at my entire list and filter it. And you could do that in Notion and click up in a bunch of different tools. So I'm known for... The, you know, that method, the, the time crafting, it's, it's a way of making your way through the day so that you are, you know, you, you can filter your focus and make every moment matter more. So you define, you define your days, you filter your focus, 
And then you make moments matter because you can turn minutes into moments, right? So that, and then the night owl stuff, I'm leaning more into, I mean, Mo, you and I had a conversation at podcast where I was talking about that. I'm leaning more into the night owl stuff because night owls have that stigma associated with them. And no one's, t- there's 20 to 25% of the working pop, the population is, is our night owls. They identify as night owls. And yes, we have stuff out there that's for like generic circadian rhythm studies, but no one, no one's sitting there going, join the 10 PM club, right? Like it's, <laughs> or let's have an excellent evening instead of a miracle morning, which by the way, all those things in those books, if you read them as a night owl, you, here's a cheat code, just go, okay. The, the, Hal Elrod says to get up this early to do this and do my savers. I'm just going to get up at eight and do them, right? Like that's that literally just that shift. But unfortunately we live in a world where, you know, if you don't show up at the office at seven, or six or whatever, and you do the work and you decide you're going to be staying late till six or seven, the CEO, let's say the, the, the unlearned or unwise CEO will praise the early riser for coming into the office early. Hey, way to, way to, way to show initiative, way to like get up and go and start the day. And then the people who stay late, like what's going on? You're not, you're not getting your work done. Like why are you here so late? You should go home, enjoy time with your family. I'm like, no, no, I suck in morning. Like, let me show up at nine. I'll stay till seven because I'm doing my better stuff later in the day. Just let me do, let me, and I have to say, wrote distributed workforce and the, and COVID helped night owls in a lot of ways because they were able to actually work according to their natural rhythms and time crafting with night owls works exceptionally well because it's a, frankly, it's a humane way to approach a world that is often trying to have us act in a way that is inhumane. Yeah. I actually was going to ask about the whole night owl um, concept that you focus on a lot. How do you think other than just people having, I don't know, natural cadences to their day, waking up at a certain time or feeling more productive at a certain time, how do you think people can start to identify if they're a night owl or an early bird, et cetera? And I think kind of like what you were alluding to, there's a lot of shame in being a night owl when our world is constructed in the way to praise those who rise early and sort of rise to the task when night owls aren't doing the opposite of that. They're just doing it a little bit later and in their own way. I think, I mean, there are assessments out there that you can do and, and you can, you know, figure out, you know, uh, roughly whether or not you're a, 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 an early riser or a night owl, you know, to confirm it for you, but you generally know, Like most people generally know that they're like, like if you're getting up at six in the morning and you're staying up to like 11 at night, if you're staying up to 11 at night and you feel like you still like, you're not like, like, and you, and you're fighting it, you're fighting going to bed or you're fighting to go to bed at 10 or whatever, then there's probably something there that's telling you like, you're not really listening to your body clock very well. Conversely, if you're staying up late and you're exhausted and you wake up at 6 AM and you're like, I'm awake then that's probably a sign that you're you're somebody that is either an early riser or what they call like a nine to five or, or a diurnal person, right? So I think the other way to know is, again, to start to use energy as a gauge. What can I do when I'm like, you know, hey, track your energy levels. Look at what you're, and this is where smart watches can come in handy because they can see like, hey, where, when are you at? When, like, so they're, again, not going to crap on technology that can kind of give a sense of, you know, I, I like the quantified self-movement in in parts. I don't like people who live by it to the utmost because then I think you're just, instead of living life, you're just kind of processing life. <laughs> like you're kind of, yeah. you're pro, you know, you're not progressing, you're processing. Um, so, uh, but I, th- I think that, 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 that stigma, the hard part is the world is geared towards early birds and nine to fivers in general, think about school, right? Like, so it's, it's known there's studies around this. I can't cite any offhand right now, but there, I mean, it, most people know that teenagers, they need, they, their sleep is all messed up. They need to sleep in later and they go to bed later because they're going through those changes. Right. And some stay that way. Like I stayed as a night owl. My daughter is still a night owl, right? My son, not so much. Um, but what do they do? You start when you start school, you start at like nine, right? When you're younger, but as you get older in most school districts, there's others that are changing this, which is good because the data shows that teenagers shouldn't be starting at seven forty-eight in the morning when they go to school. 
they're useless at that time. And it's not like they get yeah. to choose whether or not they're going to take math first thing or, or phys ed, which may even be worse. Like physical education. If you're a night owl and you're taking physical education in the morning, you, the risk of you getting hurt is greater because your body's mm-hmm. not warmed up. Right. I mean, even, even folks like, uh, I think Andrew Huberman and others, I might be misquoted, but I know Dr. Michael Bruce has said this, like working out first thing in the morning isn't necessarily ideal for early risers either because you, you just woke up. Right. So I think that there's a lot of myths around this, Katie, to the point of like, and the stigma exists because, you know, the early bird gets the worm. A lot of successful people get up really early, but no one looks at the, and the studies generally gear around getting up early, but there's plenty of night owls out there that have done very well, like successful historical night owls yeah. that have done amazing things. And I mean, so, you know, from all walks of life, just like, you know, there's tons of early risers. I think the thing is, is that we have so many more important battles to fight than our body clock. And we don't think about that. Well, it's funny that you were saying that, Mike, because my next question was, um, how can we support younger people of school age in figuring out what works for them? Because I, for myself, I went to pretty intense schools when I was younger. I went to like a magnet high school and I was sleeping like three, four hours a night just so I could get work done. And then I would have like math or bio in the morning at 8 a.m. And I was like, not functioning in these classes. Meanwhile, those were the subjects I was worst at. So I was like really trying to push myself. Um, And I always thought something was wrong with me too for not being super productive when I had like free times during the day. So Mm -hmm. how can we, like you said, I mean, pushing school back for younger people, how can we start to change the narrative around this? Because if I were to go back to my high school schedule and right now I would just collapse. I was drinking so much coffee and not sleeping and not functioning and it's awful. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing too, is that, I mean, like there's an example, like people like, well, just have some coffee. That'll wake you up. The problem is, and there's been studies around this too, like having coffee to start off your day is like, basically it doesn't help you because the way cortisol works, right. You know, and Huberman's talked about that and he's not the only one. If you're not an Andrew Huberman fan, there's plenty of data around the fact that cortisol takes some time to wear off. So the best, like the coffee I was drinking was decaf, right. Mm -hmm. And then why do I drink decaf coffee in the morning? It's not because I need the caffeine. It's because I love the ritual and the smell and all that stuff. So there's like a placebo kind of effect there, probably related to back when I was going to school. Like I need to have this coffee. I think that there needs to be a lot more education around this. I think that schools, unfortunately, and there's this documentary called most likely to that I watched a few years ago that talks about the educational system needing some reform on more multiple fronts, um, including the fact that the pursuit of numerical scores in a test oriented environment may not be the way forward for one. Well, it's definitely not the way forward for everybody, but it doesn't create um, entrepreneurs in the same way. It doesn't, it, it, and it never really was designed to this documentary is really good. Cause it goes into like the whole history of how education was like this current system was founded and stuff. Like I can tell you that one of the things that drives me nuts, I don't know if this is happening in the States as much, but here um, they, uh, they no longer ring a bell when uh, in some of the schools, when it's time to shift classes, because people can be sensitive to that, like sensitive to loud noises and things. And I'm like, that's fine. I can appreciate that. But there has to be a way to signify that it's time to move into the next thing. Um, Because that's the way the schools have been kind of structured, right? So you've got people that are, because everyone learns at a different pace, everyone like their their clocks are all operate. What if everyone's clocks are different, right? So you end up running into this issue of how do we know when to move? That may not even be the right answer because let's face it. Once people leave high school, they're not like told, okay, well the bell will ring when you're supposed to be in this next area of your life. So then that alarm will tell you to turn into, you know, you know, that's not the way the world works. It's also not the way like taking bio you're, you're going to use that in certain careers, but you may not necessarily use it. You know, once, you know, not everybody's going to use it. Right. Exactly. So, so, how do we teach the in the where where different skill sets combine right like this this school i think it's in san diego it's called high school high and the history department and the drama department work together to build a play that's historically accurate so now all of a sudden you're taking these two disciplines and combining them 
and you're showing students like, so yeah, if you're going to take drama, you know, you're going to leave you, the whole world's not drama, just like the whole world's not math and the whole world's not English. Right. So there's a lot of things that can go on around there, but when it comes to the night owl stuff, I, I would be interested to see the data and the data matters because that's the way a lot of things get changed because numbers are again, mutually understood to see how test scores. Cause that's what's being used right now for those that come to school later, you know, in the later districts versus those that are in the earlier districts and see what that, what that holds, because I do know, and I mean, again, I'm not an expert in this. And, and again, I'm hearing this through third parties to, to a degree is that funding can be dependent on tests, like how well a school does. Yeah. Right. So that, that may be the key is to say, okay, well, these schools that aren't starting classes until like nine 30, how are they doing versus the ones that are starting at eight 30 and see how that, but that would take, um, Either that'll take somebody in power who has a kid that's struggling because they're a night owl or a bunch of them, or it will take like a school that has done it to showcase how well they're doing with their testing and then funding as a result. And then other schools will, maybe we should look at, cause it doesn't, I mean, you're shit. We're talking about shifts of like a half hour to an hour. Like we're not talking yeah. about like night school. We're talking about like starting. It's school. not no. groundbreaking. <laughs> no, it's not at all. And again, when we talk about homeschooling, the, the freedom to do that is, you know, amazing. Like you could, if you know your kid's a night owl and you're homeschooling, you just gear the schedule around that. But that's one-to-one in the public school system. You're not going to get that, right? Yeah. You're going to get one-to-many. So, you, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a complex issue. I don't think it's as complicated as people like, I'm, I, I, I don't want to say complicated because it's really not that complicated in my mind, I think it's more complex and I think it's solvable, but I, I go back to the stigma of, well, we want to teach these people to be early risers because if they're early risers, then, and that's really what, I mean, frankly, the, the, the bell system was designed to get people to work shifts, right? Up oh, your shifts up, up oh, this, up oh, that, like that's, there's a lot of history around there. So I know it's a long answer and it's something, I mean, I would love to go into a school, schools in general. Yeah and teach time craft and cause time crafting works for kids. Like my kids have used it. Right. So, and, but, but the thing about teaching kids, this stuff is you can't go into high schools and teach them right away. You have to get into them like in middle school, middle school is where that, cause then they're going to be able to go, okay, well, and, and kids understand this, right? Like they're in school in school. You're working by themes. Anyway, you knew, Hey, Monday f- to Friday from eight to nine, I'm in math class. Like that's themed. So your brain is geared towards, you know, that, right. So I don't think it's a foreign concept and I'd love to be able to, that's one thing I've wanted to do is go into schools and kind of say, look, you know, managing time is a, trying to manage your time is a waste of time. Let's manage your relationship with time. And here's some ways you can start to do that. Yeah. I mean, that would have changed my life as a student for sure. And I liked school, but I think there was a lot of things I pressured myself well, to and, fit and, into. And, and the thing is, is when I go to like, one thing I, I really take pride in is I have a background in comedy and performance, right? So that's mm-hmm. what, like what I was, so when I go and do talks and when I, when I present myself like this, I, tr- I try to infuse some humor into the mix because it's disarming, right? It, it disarms people, gets people to relax a little bit more. And then I can impart information that may seem radical to a degree where it's like, what do you mean we should be, you know, like I've had people when I've said, you know, you should look at your to-do list through this, or you should break down a project into its smallest particles. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I'm like, you do. Because I mean, I can tell you one of the things I do in a talk is I will say, we're going to take 60 seconds and do absolutely nothing. Close your laptop, but keep your eyes open. Don't want you to close your eyes. And we're just going to sit here for 60 seconds and do nothing. And I mean, I do a bit of stage performance craft at that point where I'll like, look at my watch. I'll sit, I'll do like a little tapping of my fingers cause I'm kind of bored. And then I say, okay, time's up. And then I ask people how they felt. And some are like, I felt great, felt relaxed, felt like others are like anxious, waste of time. Like, you know, all, all you know, tense. And I'm like, well, how many of you meditate? And a bunch of people that meditate, I'm like, how did that feel like a minute to you? They're like, no, I felt like it felt longer. It felt, you know, it, it did, it, it felt right. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't 60 seconds. It was 42. I, n- I never give everybody a full minute. Yeah, that's it. the look, uh, Katie, wow. the back of that look. It's like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah. So what if you just took 30 seconds 
Like it's not that much. We often like, if you were to sit for a minute and do nothing, it would feel like forever unless you meditate, in which case you get better at, you know, kind of understanding that, um, you know, or you're under the influence or something like that. That's <laughs> another way to time kind of changes. <laughs> but the point is, is that we, 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 we're trying to com, com, control something that we can't control because number one, it can't be. And number two, we don't even understand it well enough to even begin to do that. So why not, instead of trying to control it, be friendly with it, embrace it, you know, yeah. have a good relationship with it. And that can carry us outside of work. I mean, through our whole lives. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, your kids are using the the time crafting method. And I, my question is like, how do you pass along what you know about productivity to your wife and kids? And <laughs> how do you think about productivity within the context of family more broadly? Like, do you yeah. and your wife have uh, a notion board or something to help you track what needs to get done? I, I tread very softly with this because again, it's nuanced, right? Like my kids, when they use time crafting, they use the one thing about time crafting that I also really tried to do was make it so it could be approached from a top to bottom or bottom to top. Like you don't have to use all elements of it. Right. So I have a lot of, my kids will use things like the energy is a huge one for them. Like they'll look at their list and they'll put like a down arrow next to things that don't take a lot of time or a lot of energy and then up arrows next to those ones that do and they'll work there. So they're taking implementations of that, but I'm not going, here's how time crafting works. And this is same thing with my wife. Like we don't share any technology. The only thing that we share is we share one password. Like I have a one password family plan. Um, we have, I will probably as reminders on the Apple notes side of the Apple notes, like the Apple ecosystem, I could probably infuse more of that into our household if I wanted to, in terms of like grocery lists and things like that. But the only thing that my wife and I do that are, is even probably re like remotely related to helping with this is every Sunday we have what we call the effing meeting. And it's, it's the F's stand for food, finance, fun, and family. So we will sit down every Sunday and we will do our budget and you need a budget, which is why my wife. So I had to steal her for that for this upcoming Sunday because she's like, oh, I'm like, don't worry. Like even the logo changed the icon. So that's going to probably like what? Why did they change the icon? I'm like, whatever. Anyway, I have my icons all night. All my blue icons are now messed anyway. Um, <laughs> but but we talk about so we'll do finance. And we don't do that. We, we don't have an order either. Like I'm like, we must talk finance first then family then food. No, it's normally like finance normally kicks it off just because now we know what resources we have. Then it's food because we plan our meals. And that way we don't necessarily stick to the plan, by the way, like most people are like, Oh my God, that must be, no, we just want to have a default in place. So that way, we know, like, well, spaghetti is supposed to be tonight's dinner, but do we really want like, so that way we know, well, all right, fine. We'll just make spaghetti. But if yeah. we go for dinner, that's okay. Or if we make something else, that's okay. Um, family is like what family stuff's going on. Like, what does my daughter have going on? Although right now she's in Europe, so not much of a factor um, in terms of making those plans. But like my son has D&D &D Club and, you know, there's there, there's Halloween coming up and all that stuff as we're recording this. So like those things. And then fun, like what fun activity do we want to do as a couple or as a family? And we do that on Sundays. And it really, because Sunday is how I start my week. I start my week on a Sunday. And what it does is it allows us to, when we're just sitting with each other, have like just connective conversations. Like we're not, Oh, we got to go. Don't forget to pay that bill or let's do this or let's no. It's just, we can actually be in the relationship and be a couple and go on date nights and not talk about any of those four things unless we really want to. So I think that that, and, and I actually did a workshop for my community on this and they were like, Oh my gosh, I should really make time for this, but we don't want to do it on a Sunday because of whatever. I'm like, well, you don't uh, like, again, you don't have to do it on a Sunday and you don't even have to do it with all. I mean, if you don't have kids, then maybe family doesn't matter. Or maybe you don't want to do the fun stuff or, you know, maybe food is not, you know, you don't want to plan as, you know, and plan a whole week. You want to plan three days, but that meeting has been huge. And it's the one thing that has stuck, but yeah, I tried to do it with her and it was not working. I tried, you know, I've tried all those things. We use Slack for internal communication between her and I about the business because she is involved with this business on the back end. But that's it. And the only reason we use Slack for that is I want to make sure that our text messages are 
personal or family oriented. And then the Slack is, I, I can open, I know if it's a Slack message, then it's from her and mm-hmm. it's about work, not about home stuff. So we want that distinction there. That's yeah. pretty much the extent of it. I, I remember giving my daughter a copy of David Allen's getting things done for teens. When it came out, it was David Allen and Mike Williams. I think that co-authored it. And the reason I did that is I'm like, I want to see if this is something that you would do even remotely. And she started to go through it. She, she read the book and she goes, I, I like the ideas. There's no way I'm going to do this. <laughs> no, she tried it. No, she was. Well, I mean, she knows. And, and yeah. I had a feeling that's what it was going to be like, because getting things done well. And I love Dave, David and I had a convert, like we did a fireside chat at a conference in April and we've known each other for a long time. And I love David and getting things done. is a fantastic framework, but it's not for everyone. Right. And if you try to go, if you, you know, and some people have it in their heads, if they're not doing it all, like every aspect of getting things done, then you're failing at it. I'm like, that's not anyone who I know that uses getting things done or any of these frameworks, they add their own, you know, personalization to it because it makes, it gives them ownership of it and it makes it feel like it's something that they can continue on with. So yeah, when my daughter saw that, I'm like, yeah, I have no doubt that you wouldn't want to do it. But she's also the type that picks up a traveler's notebook and she's using, I've seen her put arrows and I'm like, all right, all right. So like every little, every time I see that, I consider it to be a little bit of a victory. Yeah. Okay. I love the effing meeting and I need to have it. I was talking to my partner about having one because he forgets things that he has to do all the time. And I'm like, this would make my life easier too, if we were like, so. It takes wow. 30 minutes. It takes 30 minutes. One, The first one will take yeah. longer. The first one will take an hour probably because you're setting the table and you know, you might have to set up a budget if that's what you're doing or whatever. But after yeah. that, like we, we can meet and be done in 30 minutes. It's awesome. Oh my God. <laughs> and the thing is, why won't people do it? Because it's a meeting. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so why not have a meeting that really matters? And I actually have a blog post. This is the one meeting I make time for every week. It's the only meeting that really ultimately to me matters at the end of it. Cause if that meeting doesn't happen and it's, it, there have been instances where it's been like a day late and it throws things off. Cause we're like, yeah. oh, we didn't pick up part of my language, but we didn't pick dinner for Monday. Oh no. Now what? Like it just, it throws you off. So it's, it's nice to have. And it, again, you don't have to follow it. The, like, again, it's a framework for us. So you can, yeah. you can modify it as needed, but yeah, it's uh it was really helpful because it not only sets us up for the week, but allows us to be a couple and be, you know, have like dates and not think, okay, well, while we're up for dinner, having a dinner, Let's talk about, you know, what's going on with the kids. We don't need to do that. We can sit and talk about us or things that are interesting us or, or just not talk at all if we don't want to. Because once you've been married for almost 20 years, there's moments where just being together is enough. No, that's great. Um, to shift more to content creation stuff, mm-hmm. what is your favorite medium to create on regardless of how long you've done it or the popularity? Oh, I'm still, you know, I, I love writing. Still, I'm a writer at heart. So I would say that it probably varies between emails, like sending email market. Like, so convert kit is what I use for emails, but I draft it inside of um, what's it called? Drafts actually. And uh, which is a, a Mac and uh, iOS program. And so writing is still my favorite thing to do. Um, and it's made, been made a little bit easier because of AI, because I can take an idea and kind of talk to AI about it and see if I, what I'm saying makes actual sense. And then kind of, so that's interesting because, you know, I'm living on my own, like, you know, there, we're on an island here and there's not a lot of content creators that live where I live, at least in the space I'm in. So I will have conversations with um, chat GPT four about like, here's something I'm, like is thinking actually doing and is doing actually <laughs> thinking, let's talk about it. And it'll be like, I might break it at some point. Maybe, maybe that's what'll happen. Chat GPT four will go down and be like, what happened? Mike Vardy started to try to talk deep and philosophical about it. <laughs> he broke it. <laughs> it started the first to person to break it. <laughs> but I mean, I've been podcasting for so long. I, uh, that medium goes back to my college radio days. So I really do like that. And I do love performing, like getting on stage and you know, like that's, I was, I was going to go into acting and all that stuff. But I mean, if we go back to the earliest roots and we always kind of go back to what we did as a kid, I wrote a novella in grade six and went to the young authors conference in near Toronto and read this. I still have the novella and it's like inspired by like Douglas Adams is writing back in the day. And 
And at the end of the day, that's why like writing was what started me down this path. And so I'd say writing is probably the the medium in terms of the platform, I would say at this point, because it, because I would say that ConvertKit allows me to have a warm audience. Like it's, again, it's, it's almost like performance in that, you know, they're in this arena and I'm able to get on stage and just share a story with them. So that's probably it. But vi- people have been saying, Mike, we want you on video. We, we, you know, we want more video of you. My YouTube channel has grown despite my best efforts to not have it. <laughs> despite, <laughs> so I've never heard that one before. Yeah, despite, despite my efforts not to do anything with it. But I mean, I, I see it. And that's so again, back to the original question about like procrastinating. It's, it's podcasting. I can. I've dialed in YouTube. There's a lot more to it. So that's an area I need to spend more time in. Yeah. Speaking of podcasting, you uh, used to host a podcast called three minutes of time crafting. It had a very specific format. It was three minutes was just you daily, basically one idea. You stopped that back in 2019 before creating your current long form interview podcast called a productive conversation. I'm curious, could you walk us through like the thought process of why you decided to pivot? And also like, how did you grow your podcast to over 6 million downloads? So a productive conversation has been going on longer than that. Like the, so three minutes of, con- so it, it used to be called the productivity as podcast before that. So I, th- we're actually, as, as of this recording, we are in production on episode 500 right now of that show. Awesome. And, I've po- and I've podcasted before that. I did like work awesome when I was working for them. I did their podcast. I've done mics on mics, which was on the five by five network, which became work flowing. I had a short lived podcast called Productivity, which um, <laughs> is even harder to say and spell than productivity is. Um, <laughs> that was that was another interview. But the interview based podcasts were ones that I was very familiar with. It, why I did the three minutes of time crafting is I wanted to try a daily one to see how that would work. The the thing about podcasting when you're using it as another vertical is that it, you know, if you're, tr- you, you can, you can run out of time, you know, to do things well. And that's kind of, so I stopped doing the daily because I felt that it was taking me away from some of the other things that I knew I needed to do, work on books, build my community, things like that. Um, so I stopped doing that one, I, but I started the Night Owl one just recently because now that, you know, that one's bi-weekly, the Night Owl space. Um, and it will be a mix of me and interviews and things like that because, and Mo, it was when we were, it was actually a conversation you and I had at Podcast Movement where you said, hey, is there any episodes of a productive conversation that talks about Night Owls? I'm like, a few, but there weren't really any that were geared specifically towards it. I'm like, well, I'm leaning towards this Night Owl stuff more, so let's just start this podcast and I started it within like a few weeks of coming back from podcast movement. That's so, so cool. Our conversation was kind of the impetus for me to go like, this is the thing. This is the one action I can definitively take when I get home. So I did. Um, and how I got to 6 million downloads is as um, boring a uh, an unsexy a story as people. <laughs> I just kept doing it. I just kept, I just showed up, kept doing it consistently Eventually, uh, an advertising agency reached out to me and said, hey, we've noticed your podcast. Would you like to uh, work with us for advertisers? I said, yes, we bring ad revenue. So it's probably the one machination of my business that is not broke and doesn't need fixing in a lot of ways. And we just, you know, the, if anything, the only thing it needs is more promotion, like marketing. I'm, I'm not, that's an area that we need to work on for sure. But yeah, just showing up consistently and releasing every single Wednesday got us to 6 million. It's just being there, you know, consistently. So for those, so for those starting a podcast, stop asking in the communities, like, how do I monetize my podcast? How do I like, there are ways, but the, the way that you probably don't want to hear is just keep doing it. Yeah. It's like anything, like, how do I become productive? Well, you gotta try where there's no silver, but we live in a culture that is like, I want it fast and I want it now, Yeah. but nothing, very few good things. I mean, Taylor Swift's tour has just destroyed records, right? Um, Taylor Swift couldn't do that tour, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. Right. And I remember talking to my kids about this cause they were floored by the cost of like tickets. And I said, when you buy a ticket, <laughs> you're paying for a lot. Like, Yes. Admittedly, 
we can't get into a, a conversation about the ticket sellers. Let's talk about the artists. Cause I think that, 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 that seller situation is a whole other conversation, but you're not just paying for Taylor Swift. You're paying for all the crew you're paying for, but you're also paying for everything that Taylor Swift did up to that point. Mm. That's why, you know, when somebody asks me, Hey Mike, you know, will you work with me one-on-one? And I tell them, or I've, and they're like, wow, that's a lot. I'm like, yeah, but you're paying for everything to this point. Hmm. you're paying for my experience. You're paying for my expertise. You're paying for my insights. Just like with Taylor Swift, you're paying for her, her body of work. That's really what that comes down to. And so again, with, with, you know, with podcasting, it's, you know, the more you do it, the more you show up, the, you're, you're going to have a body of work and that creates value both, you know, in terms of qualitative value, but also quantitative. Yeah. Is Taylor a night owl, Mike? Mm-hmm. She's naturally a night owl. That was the first thing I looked up is actually something. I think that was really? on one of my episodes. It was on one of my episodes. I think it was episode one or episode two. I mentioned it. She is a night owl. Now, now she gets up early. She gets up well early. She gets up at like seven, seven thirty. but she's up till one, two in the morning. If she had her druthers, most, if she had her druthers, she would probably get up way later. Most art, most artists like think about it. Musicians, comedians, when are they perform? When are they doing their job? At, At night. night, yeah. Right now, some and and by the way, anyone who's ever performed, when you're done performing, you don't go. Well, time for bed. No. <laughs> you're on a high. Like there, yeah, it, it, you're socializing. There's the whole. I'm an actor as well, so I, I, I know, you know exactly yeah, what I'm it's talking like about. You're going out and like you're talking with people. You're getting drinks, and then you're like, oh God, I got to be up the next day. Sometimes it's counterintuitive to the actual work that you're doing, but which, it's true. You I have think, to be on, right. which is what I think happens. So I, I would not be at all surprised if musical art, like Taylor, I would not be at all surprised that what Taylor will fit in. If she can, she'll get a nap in. There's no question in my mind that she, she would have to. Yeah. Um, and she's now at a point where she has enough people that can kind of safeguard and create boundaries for her that she'll get that nap in. Like they'll yeah. be like, you need to go take a nap because if you don't, and she's, I mean, she may not need that person because she's very savvy and she's made some excellent business choices and she's super smart. So she's and hyper aware. So she may be going, you know what? Every day at two, I, I have, I have to have an app or, or whatever. Right. Like, and that's the thing is, is yeah, as an actor, exactly. Like I would do a show and I'd be like improv or you, and whether the show, whether you killed or whether you bombed, you'll still have that, that energy, that you're buzz. vibrating. And, yeah. yeah. You're vibrating and you, you can't, there's no quick shut off for that. And you know, even, even people go, well, yeah, have a couple of drinks. It'll no the drinks. All they do is they're a social setting. They're not going to, they're not going to dull those senses. They may speed up the process of you, you know, cause it's a depressant, right? Like it, it's, it may speed up the process, but it, it, it doesn't work that way. So yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of people that most would be like, you know, I, I remember sending an email once and it was just a, it was a link. And it was like, look, even the most powerful person on the planet is a night owl. And this is when Barack Obama was president. And I'm Canadian. I have to preface this. And I just said, like, I've, I read the profile of what he does in a day, right? And I love those Vanity Fair videos of what I do in a day and all that stuff. I sent that email. And most of the responses I got had nothing to do with night owl stuff when it came to that email. I had a lot. I had some people going, I can't believe you're a fan or whatever. I'm like, I, I have no dog in this fight. I'm just pointing out that this person <laughs> in this role is a night owl and Churchill was too. So if that helps, but I mean, the point is, is that there's a lot of people that are night owls that you either wouldn't expect or that make it okay for night owls like me to go, Oh, right. Yeah. You don't have to be up at 5. AM to thrive. You can just, you know, if you can, if you can figure out a way to do it. And I think anybody can figure out a way in their own way to do this, to gear their work so that they're doing that. Their energy is, reserved for when they need it and they're listening to their body clock, that's going to allow them to be super successful um, in whatever way they define that, you know, they'll be able to get, I mean, if getting through the day feeling accomplished, despite the fact that your night out is your version of success, you could absolutely do that. If thrive, like there's no question in my mind, but yes, Taylor Swift as a night and you know, it may make it uh, challenging uh, even on the West Coast, NFL games don't start till 10 a.m. So she could even go to Travis Kelsey's uh, games when she's on the West Coast. So there's that. <laughs> I know. New update in her life. Um, 
So we'll make this section rapid fire. I mean, we have so many awesome nuggets in this interview and I'm leaving and I very excited. Fire. I will rapid fire this time. No, no, I trust. Don't I've, worry. I've been on long enough now. My, I'm awake. So now I can actually. <laughs> I, I know. Like, let's go. Um, so can you shine the spotlight on another creator? Who else should our audience watch? Ooh, um, Mike Schmitz is making some amazing stuff with relation to using um, Obsidian, which is a kind of an idea creation tool. But he also he does it in very interesting ways. I think he's he's somebody that I think more people should be paying attention to. Cool. What's a game or a piece of content you're currently obsessed with and why? Ooh, um, a game or a piece of content. That, you oh said you God. played video games, so maybe I do that's- play video games. Uh, I'm not playing many right now because my son is totally. Oh, no, my camera. Hold on. This camera yeah. loves to loves to do this. Oh, this camera Which drives camera me nuts. It? <laughs> it's a Sony a 6,000, but for some reason, the battery just loves go to crap Am- out on go, me. Go on Amazon and is. get a dummy battery for it. I have one. I have a dummy battery and I have a battery pack. Like so I have a whole battery, battery that plugs in. And it, it still does it even when the bat, when it's plugged into a, wow, that's weird. I don't know oh, what's anyway, up. Probably anyway. overheat. Maybe it's overheating. Who knows? Um, anyway, sorry. Um, so game that get, so my son okay. right now has commandeered the Xbox for <laughs> call of duty and uh, I think GTA. So, um, oh, I can tell you what I'm obsessed with. Uh, Puck, Do- Puck Doku, which is like the immaculate grid, but for hockey. So, um, cool. and I play that. The, I actually play that in the morning um, because it actually helps wake me up a bit. So I would say while I'm sipping my coffee, I'll like open up Puck Doku and see if I can get it within a certain time frame um, and challenge myself to try to get like players that are more obscure it's like immaculate grid, obviously for football and baseball and stuff's popular on TikTok, And so I'm just doing it for hockey because it makes me feel all national and pridey and stuff. Love it. Um, and where can everybody find you? You can find me at productivityist.com. And if they want to get my free time crafting starter kit, go to productivityist.com slash kit. Awesome. This episode was recorded with StreamYard. If you want to record a podcast like this, check out the link in the description to get started. Thanks for joining us on Inside the Creator Studio. See you next time.